central MOU. Oh, sorry, uh, got it. This meeting, these live streams, got it. Okay. Yeah, so we actually was asking. Yeah. Okay. Whenever you want. Uh, yeah, whenever so. Whenever you uh, want, we can start, or you want to wait a few minutes. I don't know. Yeah, so know. I'll wait a couple of minutes and then uh, we can we'll start. So as uh, India is involved uh, with the 30 meter telescope, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Is also your institute involved with that uh, in some uh, form? Yeah, some at some extent, but uh, some extent they are involved. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the talk, I have prepared uh, a brief uh, introduction on the also on the ELT and the instrumentation program, just to put <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Andes in talks, that's okay. Yeah, that would be good, yeah. Okay. No, because maybe someone has, has, has not heard about the ELT, so he said, what is he talking about? <laughs> I don't think so. I think everybody knows about the ELT. <laughs> At least the name is very popular. Yeah, yeah. the name, yes, but the, the, which instruments there will be and uh, yeah. the plants. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. yes. So um, we can probably start now. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today we are happy to have uh, Professor Alexandro Marconi as our speaker. Professor Marconi is uh, currently a professor in astronomy and astro uh, physics and astronomy division uh, in the University of Florence, Italy. And uh, he is the uh, principal investigator of this upcoming uh, Andes instrument, which he is going to talk about. So this is the high resolution spectrograph for the ELT. Uh, so uh, Mar Professor Marconi got uh, his PhD uh, from University of Florence. And then, I saw, uh, then he was a visiting uh, research assistant at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, he also got uh, various award and he's also in different committees also. So for example, he has been awarded uh, for his uh, thesis, the, the best thesis award, the Livio Graton. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Yeah, yes, yes. So, and uh, he has been a member of various international committees, uh, in particular uh, between 2012 to 2014, he was the chair of this uh, scientific and technical committee, STC, uh, for the European Southern Observatory, ESO. And uh, Alexandro is a uh, very, uh, I mean, very much expert in the field of active galaxies, supermassive black holes, and the connection between black hole and host galaxy. In fact, he has uh, two uh, lead author papers with more than 1500 citations in this uh, AGN and black hole connections. Uh, so, um, so I had actually uh, personally had a chance to visit him uh, when I was doing my first year of PhD and I could travel uh, to Florence. And he showed me uh, uh, the uh, city as well as some uh, nice food I could have. <laughs> so thanks for that again. <laughs> so anyway, so um, you uh, now the floor is yours and uh, welcome. You can start your talk. Uh, thank you, Suvendu. Thank you for inviting me. It is a pleasure to be here and uh, be uh, not online and give us a talk. Uh, it would have been much better to be there in personally, but uh, maybe next time. So, Andes. Uh, Andes is the high resolution spectrograph for the LT, and uh, this presentation is basically done on behalf of the large uh, consortium, the Andes Consortium. But before moving on, uh, just let me 
tell you that Andes is the new name of the instrument, which was formerly known as IRES, the E IRES for the ELT, not to be uh, confused with IRES for the for the CAC. So this is this is why also we changed uh, the name. So first of all, uh, the consortium behind this. We are a very large international consortium with uh, over 30 institutes from 13 countries. And uh, the Italian National Astrophysics in Italy is the leading technical, technical institution. So briefly, the European ELT will be the largest optical infrared telescope in the world with a 39 meter segmented mirror with over 790 segments, one meter hexagonal segments. And uh, at variance with the existing telescope nowadays, it will be a fully adaptive optic assisted telescope, meaning that uh, it will only work uh, if uh, the adaptive optic is working. Of course, it will be working at different, uh, uh, at different levels, uh, but uh, that will be important also to, to phase uh, all the mirrors and to correct for distortions due to winds, uh, gravity, and so on. It will be located on a hill, which is the Cerro Amazones, which is about 20 kilometers from the, the Paranal, the Cerro Paranal. So it will just, just be part of the Paranal Observatory. It will not be a new observatory, just a new telescope for the Paranal Observatory. The construction uh, officially started in 2016. The first light is expected at the end of 2027, even though I suspect that it will be delayed by a bit because of the current difficult uh, international situation, which we all know, which we have all experienced. In this cartoon, uh, you have a comparison of the sizes of the telescopes uh, and uh, some reference like a tennis court or the basketball court. And here is this, uh, a green uh, uh, ring uh, is the is the ELT and compare with the competitors which are the 30 meters and the giant Magellan telescope so uh, there is this nice web page uh, uh, created by ISO elt.iso.org where you can find uh, uh, all the information that you need what I will briefly tell you about now, just to set the context for Andes, is the uh, instrumentation program of the ELT. The instrumentation program is uh, basically, it has now uh, seven instruments. We have uh, Mikado, where the PI is uh, Rick Davis from the uh, Max Planck uh, uh, Institute in Germany. And this will be basically a spectrograph, a single spectrograph, but mostly an imager a high diffraction, high resolution diffraction limited imager. Then there is a, another instrument, which is a basically an adaptive optic module capable of providing both single conjugated and multi-conjugated adaptive optics coupled mostly with Mikado. And the PI of this instrument is Paolo Ciliegi from Italy. Then we have uh, the uh, Harmony instrument. The PI is Niranjan Tate from the University of Oxford. It is basically an integral field unit. Uh, I, if you know uh, what MUSE is, uh, it's similar to MUSE in terms of number of spaxels and uh, uh, field of view. Of course, a rescale to, to, to the ELT. Then we have METIS. The PI is Bernard Brand from uh, NOVA, uh, Leiden. And uh, it is basically a mid infrared instrument. You see, it will operate in the L, M, and N bands. And it is both, it has an imager, a single disk spectrograph, and an integral field unit. These are the so called first light instruments in the sense that this instrument will be, should be available uh, within uh, one or two years of the first light. I mean, they, I don't know which one will be at the first light, but then within one or two years, all these instruments should be at the telescope. And then we have the, uh, the other instrument like Andes, which I will be talking about. It's a single object integral or integral field unit, uh, uh, high resolution spectrograph. Then there is Mosaic, the PI is Lydia Tasca from Marseille in France, and is a multi-object spectrograph. And finally, uh, although this, has not, this project has not started yet, is the PCS, which is the Planetary Camera for Surveys, which is basically a camera with a stream IO. And the goal of this instrument is one of the goals of the ELT, that is to image Earth-like exoplanets around sun-like stars. 
and this is possible for about 10 stars uh, in, the, in our neighborhood that this will be done with this instrument which is still on uh, in the research and development phase because the technology which we need for get this extreme AO is not yet uh, available it's being developed now then here is a, a figure. This figure has been uh, obtained, uh, these figures from the ISO webpage on TLT. This is a summary of the imaging and spectroscopic capabilities of the instrument. So for the imaging, you have the wavelength coverage for Mikado and Metis. And then for the spectroscopic capability, you have both the wavelength coverage and the spectral resolution. You see that Andes uh, will basically uh, be a very high spectral resolution and will go from uh, 0.4 to uh, potentially 2.4 microns. Uh, uh, I'll, but we'll come back to this later. And then, you, of course, uh, you have this uh, Harmony, Mikado, and uh, Mosaic, and as well as Metis at lower spectral resolution. Here is the, a comparison of the field of view and the spatial resolution. Uh, these plots gives you an idea of the complementarity of all the instruments, of course. And the uh, Andes also not only has the, uh, the, the scene limited mode, but also can work with a single conjugated adaptive optic. Just a clarification here, you see the uh, what is called is GLAO scene limited. The scene limited for the ELT means uh, with the ground layer adaptive optics. So even the mode, which is called scene limited in the LT, will have some basic adaptive optic correction because otherwise uh, the, the telescope will, will not work. Okay, what are briefly the synergies of this uh, telescope? Uh, you know, the LT will be able to operate with the, the major observatories which will come online in the next year as well as the existing ones, existing ones meaning uh, the VLT and ALMA, as well as now, finally, JWST, but then it will be, will operate the SKA, uh, Euclid, uh, LST, uh, Plato, and if, uh, if we be there, Athena. Okay, what are the competitors of the ELT and what are the, their instrument programs? Is it just a simple table? The competitors are the giant uh, Magellan telescope, the 30 meter telescope, which uh, you know very well. And uh, I won't enter into the details, but uh, basically I just point out that uh, for the high resolution spectroscopic part, uh, these are the instruments in the two telescope, which would be the analogs of Andes. Okay, again, if you want to have any, uh, some more information on the instrument, just go in this web page for the other instruments and then you find all the links uh, to the instrument web page as well as some basic uh, information. So, but now let's start uh, uh, talking uh, about Andes and let's start talking about what is the broad context where Andes uh, uh, was born. Uh, basically, uh, the flagship science cases of the ELT are the detection of light signature in Earth-like exoplanets and the direct detection of the cosmic expansion reacceleration, the so-called Sandage effect. And both of these flagship science cases require high-resolution spectroscopy. On the other hand, high-resolution spectroscopy is, uh, I think, a very interdisciplinary uh, observing mode uh, in uh, from exoplanets to cosmology and fundamental physics. So it covers a wide range of uh, research fields. And also it is built uh, upon a successful ISO tradition as demonstrated by all these instruments, uh, last of which is Espresso, which came online uh, uh, since uh, a couple of years. And uh, just to demonstrate uh, how much ISO relies on high resolution spectrograph, we can say that more than 30% of the ISO publications are due to the uh, high resolution spectrograph. So there is a very strong community in the ISO member states uh, on, um, on high resolution spectroscopy. Then there is a very important point, I think, that uh, 
high resolution spectroscopy with eight meter telescope is becomes is starting to become photo starved, meaning that uh, you are limited to the brightest sources. You you can't study the fainter sources, and this is where a large telescope is is important. So how uh, Andes or Iris, as it was called earlier, was born? Basically, during the preparation of the construction proposal for the ELT, there were two concepts which were studied. These were codex and simple. They were a optical and the near infrared spectrograph. And these concepts were then merged into uh, IRIS, the so-called IRIS, high resolution spectrograph, which is basically a, a spectrograph which can provide at least 100,000 spectra resolution with a very wide simultaneous uh, a wavelength range between 0.4 basically and 2.4 microns. Uh, as a consortium, we did uh, a, a formal phase A study with uh, ISO, which started in 2016, was completed successfully in 2018, and we are just now starting phase B. And uh, we, there's been this period of uh, wait, I mean, or waiting because of the problems that DLP was facing, so they were not ready. To start to start new new instrument. Now uh, with Andes, with that kind of spectrograph, you can uh, address uh, a wide, uh, uh, an ample number, very wide, a very large number of science cases, which goes from exoplanets and protoplanetary disks to stellar astrophysics and stellar population, intergalactic medium, galaxy evolution, and fundamental physics. I will just. Uh, present a couple of, a few highlights later. And this can all be found in this old now uh, community-wide paper, which was published, which was put on Astro PH in 2013. And now with the starting of the construction of Andes, what we are planning to do in the this year, the next year, we are planning to uh, get uh, a new white paper. So we will ask again for contribution from the community and uh, prepare a new white paper because of course, in 10 years, science has changed uh, a lot. So just uh, a few highlights uh, that what Andes can do is uh, the first thing is to detect uh, the uh, bio, the so-called biomarkers. That is the uh, start by studying the uh, exoplanet atmosphere, you can detect uh, uh, molecular oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and methane. And if this has uh, abundances in the atmosphere, which are uh, out of equilibrium, meaning that they are uh, not uh, at the levels that you expect from standard physical processes like uh, photo, photo dissociation, uh, water dissociation, or so on, then you can be sure that you have uh, in the planets uh, organisms which are able to uh, to synthesize, for instance, oxygen like uh, the plants. So basically, what we are searching for in these biomarkers is the signature of plant-like uh, organisms. And uh, this can be do the study in two, uh, sorry, in two ways. Uh, one is in uh, uh, transmitted light that is uh, uh, waiting for the planets to pass in front of the star and then uh, looking on the imprint on the stellar spectrum of the absorption through the planet atmosphere. And uh, for instance, an instrument like uh, Andes can detect uh, uh, signature of uh, water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen in, in a few transits in these uh, planets, which are two Earth-like, uh, uh, two planets in the, uh, in the habitable zone around the Trappist star. And or, for instance, uh, we can study this planet in reflection. Of course, the light of the star goes twice through the planet atmosphere. And uh, for instance, in reflection, we can detect the Proxima B exoplanet uh, in, uh, in seven nights at eight sigma uh, level. And also we can detect, for instance, oxygen in, in the atmosphere of Proxima B if it is there. So this is an example of a detailed study on what uh, uh, Andes can do, uh, made by two people in, from Cambridge, which is part of the Andes Consortium. And uh, if you are interested, you can refer to this paper. I won't enter into the details on how the signal is detected in the, in the uh, exoplan, in the spectra of the stars, which is a bit more complicated than would take too much time. 
Uh, one other uh, uh, important science case for Andes is the study of the intergalactic medium and the uh, study of the chemical abundances in the IGM. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, one of the goals is the uh, detection of the chemical enrichment uh, of the universe, for instance, the one due to the pop three stars. And uh, it is very simple what we do, just uh, as you know, we use uh, uh, distant quasars as probes uh, of the light uh, of, the, of, the, of the intergalactic medium by studying the absorption lines on the quasar spectrum due to intervening absorber along the line of sight. Uh, one of the goals, uh, as I was saying, is the study of the chemical enrichment due to uh, primordial supernovae, that is the signature of Pops 3 stars, because these, how can we do that? Because these stars uh, do have uh, peculiar chemical uh, uh, patterns, and these can be detected. Here we have uh, an example of uh, two simulations. So let's look at the one on the top. It's a simulation of observation of the 7 quasars with two hours with Andes, that is with a high resolution uh, spectrograph. And the three colors are the, uh, what you would expect from normal type two supernovae, uh, from uh, a, a pop three supernova with the low mass progenitors that is lower than 40 solar masses and then from a pop three a pair instability supernova that is the one that you get with the very massive uh, progenitors so you can see that you can clearly distinguish these three cases by using by targeting these these two lines silicon two and carbon two and you have enough signal to noise in just two hours to do that with this redshift seven quasar but uh, you can do this also in 10 hours with this redshift nine, this redshift nine quasar. And the NHAB magnitude of, of 22. Uh, here is a, another simulation which gives you an example of how better we can do compared to what it is possible now. Here is a, a simulation of an observation with X shooter 25 hours of a red 7 quasar and absorbers with 10 to the minus 3 solar metallicity. And here is the spectrum that you get with the shooter. Here is the original spectrum at the spectral resolution of the shooter, and this is what you get. This is really nothing that you can use uh, scientifically, but if you go with Andes in just five hours, uh, you see that you can really start uh, doing uh, uh, measurements uh, uh, accurate measurements of the abundances of the elements uh, because of the better spectral resolution. Of course, it shooters only 10,000, but also because of the much better signal to noise. So when going 25 hours with 10,000 spec sorry, 10,000 spectral resolution to five hours with 100,000 spectral resolution, that, that's be, that makes a huge, a huge difference with Andes. Another important uh, uh, science uh, goal of Andes is the study of the variation of the fundamental physical constant with time. And here is in this figure, for instance, is a simulation of what you expect, uh, what limit you expect to be able to set on uh, the, alpine, the variation of the fine structure constant with, with Andes. And you can see that you expect to reach uh, at least a factor of four or five beta that what you can do with the VLT and the Expresso. Uh, and uh, also these are the limits that you can put on the couplings between the uh, baryonic fraction, the baryonic matter and uh, the, the dark matter, depending on the, the dark matter model. Here, uh, again, the, the final uh, uh, science case that I'm showing is the Redshift Rift, the so-called Sandwich test, basically because of the universe is uh, uh, accelerating the expansion, you should see a, a Redshift variation in a source if you observe this source at different times. You know, the Redshift is a measurement of the scale factor, then if you observe a source at different times, you see the scale factor at different time of emission. And uh, basically this you can do, you can measure with Andes. This is of course a very, very difficult uh, uh, science case because you expect the variation in the redshift of a source uh, uh, which is of the order of a centimeter per second over a, a, 
a few year time span, but this is measurable with different in different ways. And here is a, a constraint that you can put with the Andes and uh, in combination with SKA to this uh, to Omega matter and the Hubble constant. And I, I want to stress that this will be completely completely model independent in the sense that you can test, of course, the model, but the measurement. Uh, the detection of the variation of uh, the scale factor is model independent. Okay, so uh, in principle, for as much as we know, the scale factor could be constant with time, the scale factor, but and with Andes, we will be able to, to see its variation, direct variation with time. And this is the again the results of an experiment, uh, which is a legacy experiment, which basically over a time span of 20 years uh, will uh, will measure this redshift drift according to different samples. Uh, I would like to stress that this will not be observation just focused on the Sandage test, but this will be observation taken, for instance, for the study of the IGM, for the study of the variation, the fundamental physical constants, and then by uh, stacking, taking them uh, over a period of 20 years, considering them over a period of 20 years, we will be able to use them for the for the Sandage test. Okay, so there are many, I hope uh, uh, I have uh, at least uh, uh, not convinced, but at least interested in you in the fact that there are many, many interesting science cases that you can address. If you look at all the science cases that are listed in the community white paper, you realize that mainly what you need is this high spectral resolution, uh, 100,000 at least, and then an important thing, a very wide simultaneous spectral range. And of course, uh, many different observing modes according to the science case. These, uh, complex requirements, science requirements, can be uh, satisfied with the fiber-fed modular system, in which basically you have a front end where you get the light from the telescope, and then you have different fiber bundles, which brings the light to the, to the, to the spectrographs. And this is indeed the, um, the scheme which was, uh, which is basically represent the old architecture of the instrument after phase A. However, an instrument which is able to, to do all of these will be, will be very, very expensive. It will cost uh, over 50 million euros uh, only in hardware, not considering the effort, which is uh, more or less of the same, of the same order. So uh, since we didn't know at the time how much money we were, we were, uh, was available, and we still don't know, but that's another issue, uh, we needed to, to do a prioritization, okay? To, to design the instrument, we needed to, to do a prioritization of the science requirements. And this is uh, what the uh, Andes uh, science team did really at the first months of the phase A study. And I want to describe you the process this because very quickly, because I think it's a really nice job made by the science team. Basically, what the science team did was to identify the first priority. So the first priority was unanimously uh, uh, considered to be the study of exoplanet atmosphere via transmission spectroscopy. This is not only from the people working on exoplanets, which is obvious, but also from the people, for instance, working on galaxies, on stars, uh, and uh, fundamental physics. So this is priority one. Uh, this priority basically has a, a, a series of requirements. And these requirements, for instance, a resolution larger than 100,000, a spectral range, simultaneous at least between 0.5 and 1.8, these are the ones which will drive the baseline design. But now at this point, uh, with this requirement, one goes through all the science cases and look which are the science cases which can be satisfied, which can be addressed with this requirement. That is, if I build an instrument which can do these uh, exoplanet atmospheres, which other science cases can I address? And these are the science cases, for instance, uh, the ionization of the universe, the characterization of cool stars, or the detection of the primordial gas. And 
these science cases I remove from their prioritization. No need to prioritize them if they are already doable with, with this first priority. Then we go to priority two. And priority two, basically what it requires in more than the previous uh, uh, requirements is the extension to the blue. And the, we extend this priority to the study of the variation of fundamental contact clinic, which implies the extension to the blue, there are other science cases that can be addressed. And all these other science cases can be removed from the prioritization. Now, I think you have uh, uh, understood the trick. Uh, and uh, we go to priority three, which is exoplanet atmosphere via reflection spectroscopy this time. And this requires a single conjugated adaptive optic unit and a small integral field unit, which also enables a lot of other science cases. And finally, there is the Ratchet Drift, the Sandwich test, which requires a wavelength accuracy and stability of about two centimeters per second over the 20 years or lifetime of the, of the instrument. And this also allows for other science cases. So basically, while we have these four priorities as science cases, this does not mean that these are the only science cases that Andes will address, but there are a, a plethora, a, a huge number of other science cases, groundbreaking, interesting science cases that can be addressed. So this is the prioritization. And the following this prioritization, this is the new architecture that came out from, from, the, um, from the phase A and the subsequent studies. Basically, as I said, here is the focus. Can you see my mouse? Yes, yes. I, I okay, do. yeah. Here is the ELT focus, the focal plane. Uh, we will see where this is located. Then we have two interfaces. One is the scene limited front end, and then the single conjugated uh, front end. And from these interfaces, you get the fibers, bundles of fibers, uh, that takes the light to the spectrographs. So basically we have the first block of the instrument, which is the front end. Then we have the second block of the instrument, which is the fiber link, which is basically, uh, I would say the core of the instrument because it's how the instrument works. And then we have the spectral arms. The advantage of this design is that the uh, observing modes can be selected exclusively through the fiber bundles meaning that in the spectral arms, there are no moving parts. So and this is for the stability of the, of, the, of the whole instrument. And is one of the things that is needed to reach this two centimeters per second stability in wavelength. Now, the baseline design goes from 0.4 to 1.8 microns. But then as a goal, we have the possibility to extend down to the uh, ultraviolet 0.35 and uh, to the K band. So to summarize, uh, this is a modular fiber fed uh, cross dispersed shell spectrograph because we have a shell to, to reach the, the dispersion. And uh, it is this simultaneous range 0 0.4, 1.8 with goals from 2.35 and 2.4, but what is important, we have many different observing modes and mostly, which can be mostly uh, grouped in two kinds. One is the scene limited. Again, remind that this scene limited is the ELT scene limited. That is, it has some sort of low order adaptive optical correction. And then we have a diffraction limited mode uh, with a single conjugated adaptive optic system and an integral field unit. Now, as I said, the fibers are the crucial, the core of the instrument that is allowed to have basically no moving parts in the spectrum. Uh, the fiber link, the fibers, also allows to uh, select the different observing modes. For instance, here is an example. Uh, we have uh, basically, we can have two large fibers if we want to observe a single source in the scene limited mode, uh, then the fiber fiber interface. And then with all these fibers, we just align this uh, longest link. So basically we have these large fibers. We split this fiber into these uh, smaller hexagonal fibers. And then we take to that all the lights from this big fiber. And then we align all these uh, uh, small fibers along, uh, along this link. 
and or if we work in the uh, single conjugated uh, uh, adaptive optic uh, mode with the integral field unit, we have a bundle of fibers directly to get the light at the front end uh, to, to create this uh, small IFU and then we align these uh, uh, fibers uh, uh, along the slit. So I would like to stress that this uh, integral field unique uh, capability is quite unique in the sense that it has, of course, two uh, uh, field of views. One is for the scene limited mode, 0.5 by 0.5 per second, and the other one is for the diffraction limited mode. And uh, the unique thing of this IFU is that it has this very large spectral resolution, but with very wide spectroscopic range between 1 and 1.8 microns. This is the wavelength range where the adaptive optic system will work. So we are not going down to, to the optical part, but still this is unique. Even for instance, Harmony will have a smaller spectral resolution, I think up to 20,000, but with a much smaller spectral range. So of course, uh, this uh, high spectral resolution, wide spectral range uh, comes to a cost of uh, a smaller number of pixels. So for, because at the end, the total number of pixels on the infrared detectors available is the same. So both ours and Harmony, we have the same number of pixels on the detector. We just decide to use them differently. Uh, one thing that uh, you can think is that these uh, observing modes are imagination limited, meaning that you can uh, arrange this bundle of fiber as you want, and then you can uh, invent your own observing mode. Um, okay, uh, one important thing. Uh, probably we have lost the connection or I'm not sure if it is from my side. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think it is okay. disconnected now. Okay. Uh, Alexandra, you are muted. You are muted. Yes, I have seen that I lost you. Let yeah. me share again. Uh, let me share again my... Sure. Yeah. Okay, can you see me now again, my yes. presentation? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I, I saw it when I lost you because uh, I saw your face when it disappears. <laughs> okay, so basically what I was saying is that uh, um, uh, the, uh, the reflectivity of the ELT drops uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, UB part, uh, as you can see from uh, this, uh, um, which is the uh, ELT mirror throughput as a function of wavelength, you see that it drops dramatically below 0.4 microns. And uh, this is due to the fact that there is the silver coating and the fact that to be compact, the ELT has five mirrors. Basically, there are five reflectivities before getting to the focus where the instruments get, get the light. And this is uh, at variance with the TMT and the GMT where there are less mirrors and so TMT and GMT are much more efficient in the blue than the ELT. Uh, ISO is developing a blue sensitive silver coating but this is still in the research and development phase and will, be not, will not be available until a few years after first light. The point is that uh, our design allows to easily include uh, a, U, a U spectrograph. So uh, it will have to be seen first whether uh, ELT and Andes is more sensitive, for instance, than the VLT Pure Espresso, just to verify whether this is something which is worth, uh, which is worth doing. Okay. Here is a, um, a simulated end-to-end -end spectrum that you get from Andes. You can recognize in the top all the um, shell orders. You can see that you have these, uh, the two apertures. If you 
you remember the observing mode with the big two fibers getting the light, so you have two apertures, so two, two spectra. And then for uh, to keep in check the wavelength calibration, you have also this uh, uh, spectrum from a Fabry Perot uh, with the length from a Fabry Perot. And this is the extracted Fabry Perot spectrum, and then you have the extracted science spectrum. This is a real end to end uh, simulation. Now, if you want to check the performances of Andes, there is an exposure time calculator, which is only updated with the latest instrument performance. Uh, the, the name is still Iris, but we are working on a new web page with a new uh, uh, address, of course. But in the meantime, you can check if you want to look the performances of Andes. Now, uh, this uh, uh, work that we did with the computation uh, uh, to do this end-to-end -end simulation, this one, uh, the, I remember we discussed whether to buy a cluster uh, because this end-to-end -end simulation required a lot of computing power. So we decided to buy a cluster or to use a cloud computing. At the end, it was more convenient to use cloud computing with Amazon. Then Amazon uh, asked us, what are you doing with cloud computing? So we told Amazon and they liked it and they, did a press release and YouTube video on it, like uh, the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics explored the universe with the cloud and so on. So if you, if you want to look at this YouTube, it's at 30 seconds, uh, but... Okay, so where is Andes going to be? This is a 3D reconstruction of uh, uh, the telescope. Uh, the instruments are located on these last mid platforms. You can see the size, the how huge these platforms are, this is just a man. So, and this platform, just to give you an example, have the capability of uh, uh, keeping more than a hundred tons, maybe a hundred and, I don't remember the exact number, but 120 or 130 tons, so just really huge. And this is the NASMIT platform A, where the first light instrument will be located. And Andes will be located in the NASMIT platform B. Uh, this is uh, one of the parts of Andes. This is basically the visible uh, spectrograph. This here we have the front end, uh, and here is the visible spectrograph. Here is a technical design uh, to see where uh, Andes is located. So we have Andes on the NASMIT platform B. And since it's fiber fed, and for some parts of the spectra, such spectrograph, like the near infrared spectrograph, we can use normal telecom fibers with no loss of the light. So, several hundred meters, this uh, spectrograph, as well as several other parts, like the calibration unit, can be located in the CUDE room. So, this is one of the advantages of Andes that uh, only uh, the, the only parts we need to be on the NASMIT are. Uh, those in the visible uh, ultraviolet or also K-band, but the rest can be located in the CUDE room. Okay, so what is the, this is a summary of the uh, Andes capabilities. Uh, again, is a modular fiber thread uh, cross dispersed uh, a shell spectrograph with three ultra stable spectral arms, as I said, the blue, red, and the near infrared, which allows a simultaneous spectral range between 0.4 and 1.8. The spectral resolution is 100,000, but if you take, for instance, smaller fibers, you can get down to 150 and 50,000. You can observe in two ways, basically scene limited and uh, uh, diffraction limited modes. And the proposed baseline, which is the one that I show you, is basically able to address all the four science cases that are the top priorities of the instrument. So here is the, uh, how we are organized. Uh, we have uh, I am the PI and as such I am the point of contact with ISO and the rest of the world, uh, if you say you want. Then we have a steering committee. We, uh, we have uh, uh, is the main governing body. It's basically the body which is providing uh, the money to the, to the project. But we also have an executive board, which is the one which uh, 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 provide the guidance uh, together with me and the project office to the project on the day-to-day -day activities. And then, uh, of course, we have the project office, which includes uh, the uh, system team and the science team. 
Okay, and finally, here we have the major subsystem, which are the parts of the main parts of the instrument. So, as to summarize the, the size of the consortium, uh, as I said, we are more than 30 institutes from 13 countries, and uh, over 200 people worked on it on the phase A and are expected to work on the instrument. And this uh, constitutes basically uh, the state-of-the-art uh, uh, scientific and technological expertise in high-resolution spectroscopy in Europe. Just to tell you that uh, it's, we have both uh, the technical and the science part, the science team is composed of about 100 people divided in four working groups. Okay, this is just uh, an organization, just to, you won't be able to read here, but it's just to, to show you how we are organized and the work breakdown, structure, in package, uh, sub-work package, and so on. And now, uh, what just a summary slides on what are the costs, uh, the guaranteed time that you get, and the schedule. The expected cost of the baseline is about 35 million euros. And we have about 600 FTEs or more, which are needed to build the instrument over the whole duration of the project. And all these will be compensated with more uh, and then the 125 GTO nights, which we will use for joint science program of the whole consortium. So it's not that each part will get its own chunk of time. We will all do co jom, co jom, um, joint science programs. The schedule, as I said, we completed phase A in 2018 and we have been waiting to start since then, but finally, on December 2021, the ISO Council approved the construction of AMBES. And uh, we are starting uh, phase B activity this year. We had our internal kickoff uh, in, uh, in uh, end of April. Uh, phase B is expected to finish in 2024, and then we are expected to get to the telescope uh, probably in 2030, 2031. This is quite an aggressive schedule given the instrument, but uh, we try, we will try to be as fast as possible. So this is my final slide with a summary. Um, and uh, I'm open for questions. Okay, thanks, uh, Alexandra, for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, for updating us about ELT instruments and especially Andes. And it seems to be going to be a fantastic instrument with a lot of capabilities. So we are now open for question and answer. So um, please raise your hand or put your question in the chat box. There so, is a one hand raised, I see. Yes, and two questions are in the chat box also. So, um, yeah, so let's take the questions from the raise hand first. So, Yogesh, could you please unmute yourself and ask the questions? Yeah. Uh, and essentially, it's a nice talk, and uh, glad to see that the uh, main focus on this, you know, spectrograph is on exoplanet atmosphere. Uh, I noticed that <clears throat> to detect like oxygen or carbon, mono, carbon dioxide, you need, uh, you know, multiple transits. In some cases, even for yes. which you need. So this is because of the low signal for that particular atoms or molecules. Or yeah, you just to give you an idea, the expected signal of a, a single uh, absorption feature in the stellar spectrum is uh, a part per million or something of the order of that. So of course you beat that uh, by considering uh, the many the hundreds of uh, absorption lines that you have for the molecules and also the uh, integrating over, over several, uh, several um, uh, transits. This is why, for instance, all these studies, not only for Andes, but for all the other instruments, will focus on uh, red dwarfs, on uh, exoplanets, uh, in the habitable zone around the red dwarfs, because they are the period, the rotation period is manageable. Because if we look uh, on, uh, if we need uh, 20 transits on an Earth-like planet around sun-like star, of course, we will need uh, 20 years to, 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 to collect all these 20, 20 transits. 
Of course, there are all the issues about the, uh, how the red dwarfs are unstable and that could prevent the formation of life. But of course, we won't know un until we will, we will look at that. Okay, I'm sure there's a Trappist-1 system is, you know, uh, quite uh, you know, catchy, uh, catchy system because most of the instruments are focusing on that uh, planetary system. Having yeah. Like and, to, you know, some habitable planets can be seen in that system. Yeah, but in the meantime, uh, I guess that uh, also with the... Uh, there will be more candidates, of course. So, yeah, uh, by the so, time these instruments, you know, is operated 2028, so we'll have many more such kind of you know, systems. Yeah. So, by the way, what is the um, throughput of this spectrograph? The output, the output, uh, if I'm not wrong, is of the order of 10%. Oh, 10%. And it is wavelength dependent, right? Yes. I don't have the, the numbers. Uh, in mind of the or the figure, sorry, but if you want, I can uh, I can dig it for you and send it to you. If you send me an email, uh, okay. my email, by the way, is very simple: Alessandro dot Marconi at enough dot it or enough meaning. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, Suvendu can give it to you. Yes, sure. so sure. it to my office, so I can give him that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I will do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, I... Ivan, could you please uh, go ahead with the question? Okay, there is. Uh, um, okay, there is. Do we want to address first uh, the people who raised their hand or the questions yeah, in is, the chat? Yeah, the, there's a. Uh, I mean, another question is there from Jivan Pandey. Uh, so, Jivan, mm -hmm. we can't hear you. So, Are you able to listen to me? Yeah, now, now I can. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So thank you very much for uh, the nice talk. So we can compare both ELT and uh, uh, TMT. So my question is that related to exoplanet again, uh, is there any plan to do the direct spectroscopy rather than transit spectroscopy? Yes, uh, yes, it's the, let me go back. Uh, we are planning to do this uh, uh, reflection spectroscopy. Okay. This one. And this is will be done with the IFU, that is with the... Uh, that is to the IFU, not, not the, uh, this uh, and uh, IRIS. Sorry? This is through what the do you... IFU, IFU mode. Yeah, uh, this IFU mode, yes. The, the, the exoplanets in reflection will be done with this uh, IFU mode. Okay. Of course, the planet will fall in one of these uh, spark, in one or two of these spark cells and then... Uh, with the techniques of uh, uh, cross correlation with the template, we will we will find it. So using of the coronagraph or uh, no, no 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 coronagraph. coronagraph. It's just uh, the technique. I mean, it's a it's a combination of uh, adaptive optics which uh, increases yeah. the planet to star contrast. Okay, yeah. take one spark. So suppose your planet is here where my cursor is pointing. Of course, you go with the, with the adaptive optics and then you concentrate the light of the star in the central spark cell mm -hmm. and then you increase the ratio between the, the, the planet and the star and then you apply the same technique that you apply for the transmission spectroscopy. Then you simply do the cross correlation of the spectrum of the stellar reflected stellar spectrum that you observe with the theoretical template of stars plus planets. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we can now take the questions in the chat box. So, Sivrani, okay, is there a requirement on data stability of PLR1? Uh, what? To, okay, sorry. Uh, TLR1 is the, you mean a requirement on the uh, spectral resolution? On the stability of the spectral resolution, or you referring to yeah, something uh, else? Can I ask the question? Like, so, yes. oh, yeah, so. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. So, so I was wondering, this is a very um, difficult task to make this uh, prioritization. So was there a requirement on the stability at TR, T, TLR1 itself? Like, or do you achieve two centimeters per second even at? Uh, uh, that's the four. 
stability yeah, for so... PLR. Okay, so, so uh, this is driven by the Sandac test. So this is a, actually, this is one of the cases where it is difficult to transform the science requirement to a technical requirement. By technical requirement, I mean something that I tell to a, an industry, how to build something. So the science requirement is the accuracy and the stability of the spectra after I have taken them over 20 years and I compare, reduce them and compare them. Now you can imagine that uh, the science requirement, which is obvious for, for, a, for, a, for a spectroscopy, for a scientist, it's not easy to transfer into a technical requirement because that would say, how do I build the instrument in such a way that finally I get this spectra with these uh, specific uh, characteristics. But if you, uh, this is not uh, easy, but the requirement is that this is true over uh, at least 20 years. And this is what we plan to achieve, of course, apart from the stability of the spectrograph, we need uh, a, an independent absolute uh, wavelength calibration that will be obtained with a laser comb. Okay, so we plan to use a laser comb uh, to help in reaching this. But uh, I would say we are still working on the flow down of the science requirements to the technical requirements because of this uh, complexity in translating it from science to how to actually build something. Yeah, so in the beginning itself, you assume that the instrument needs to meet uh, two centimeter per second, or is it? Uh... Yes. Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah, I just, I'm just curious, what is the issue? Uh, sorry, price? sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry. I, I was. This is finally uh, also combining many spectra. It's not for the single spectrum. Because the Sandach test, uh, you will never be able to get that accuracy and stability for a single spectrum. You have to do that by combining many observations, okay? Even okay. Espresso, which plans to get down to a centimeter per se, uh, to a few centimeters or 10 centimeters per second, I don't remember, to, to detect uh, Earth like uh, planets around solar sun stars, they are doing it by combining several observations. This is not the, the what you get from okay. a single yeah. spectrum. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is it okay? I ask uh, two yes, quick please, questions. Please yeah. Go ahead. No problem. I ask as many as you want for me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like one is, uh, what is the science case for um, the IFU in the seeing limited mode? Like I wasn't. Clear. Okay. The IFU in the seeing limited mode. Uh, the IF is simply the field of view. I mean, the, in the scene limited mode, of course, you have uh, a larger field of view and uh, uh, you may want to... Oh, I don't remember exactly. Let me see. It's mostly extragalactic. Okay, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. extragalactic uh, studies of uh, extragalactic sources or the circumplanetary disks, for instance, those which are specially resolved, of course. Okay, okay. So I'm curious to know what is the actual grating size of the, these individual spectrograms? Oh, uh, the grating size, uh, I don't know exactly, but I know they are the uh, grating uh, so large as the one we need have not been built yet. I think they are of the order of a meter or so. Okay. And uh, this means that they, they plan to, to get these uh, gratings. This is something which is still being studied, of course. And they plan to probably to build these gratings by gluing together smaller gratings, because otherwise it's mm, very difficult to, to achieve. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for all. You're welcome. Uh, so, Alison, uh, there's another question in the chat box. So. Will there be a fully reduced data release similar to UVS squid? Okay, okay. Uh, this is a bit early to say because still 10 years from now, but I, I think that uh, um, as all the other uh, data from the ESO telescopes, 
uh, there will be uh, reduced uh, data. Uh, and then for uh, reduce, I mean, with a basic reduction, calibration and so on, then there will be probably some basic uh, tools for a scientific analysis available. But uh, I don't know whether, I mean, we plan to do any, what do you mean by fully reduced, by the way? Meaning uh, that uh, it's, um, it's a spectrum you get from the data and you can start using or something more. Yeah, it seems to be fully reduced uh, means that it's reduced. Reduced spectra is available. I'm not aware of, I know what UBES is, but squad, squad, I don't know what it is. It's a large program. Uh, I don't know what. Okay, any anyway, the, the person who asked the question is not in the uh, audience now. So, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, so but just to, for everyone, uh, as it happens with all the data from uh, the ISO, the, these data are available with a basic uh, simple reduction from the archive, which is fine for most uh, science cases. But if you want to uh, do a more refined calibration, of course, you have to re reduce the data. But ISO provides the pipelines to re reduce the data. So uh, this at least will be, will be available. Uh, uh, Bridges, please uh, go ahead with the question. Yeah, uh, so uh, I was just uh, curious to know the jitter uh, when you talk about seeing limited uh, uh, mode observation. Uh, let's say uh, the jitter in the seeing disk, I mean, uh, when you are tipping the energy on the fiber. So what is the label? Is there any requirement on uh, uh, the jitter label? And how uh, do you correct I, it? I, I don't, I, I frankly, honestly, I don't, I can't tell you the answer. Uh, Again, uh, you can send me an email and I can find the answer for you. What I know is that uh, probably most of the jitters should be taken care of with the low order adaptive optics, because as I said, uh, the seeing limited is not a real seeing limited mode. So uh, I, uh, I think that it will be low enough, it should be low enough to to not to have significant losses in the in from the fiber but again if you really want to know you just drop an email and i'll uh, ask to people who know and then i will let you know okay thank you thank you yeah You're welcome uh Sivrani, do you have other questions or yeah just uh, uh, <laughs> yeah so uh, alessandro would uh, all these spectrographs one the UBV is mounted on the NASMET and the other one is in the infrared. No, not, not all of them because there is not enough room. I mean, there is not enough mass available because we have to share the platform with the mosaic or other instruments. So as I was showing here, we will be the, uh, the visible, uh, the B and V spectrograph will be on the NASMET because they the fibers there can be only at most a few tens of meters, less than 50 meters or something, because otherwise you have significant losses of the light. But for instance, the near infrared and the red spectrograph can work with normal telecom fibers. So that's very easy, the, tel the fibers which are used for telecommunications, and then can be uh, long as uh, several hundred meters. This means that we can we be, take the light with this fiber and bring it to the, to the room. So the infrared spectrograph and the red spectrograph, which is not here in this diagram, will be down in the CUDE room together with, uh, for instance, the um, other interfaces and the calibration unit. Mm -hmm. So both would and have similar the, stability? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, 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 thank you. Yes. Uh, Bridges, do you have other questions? Because I see the hand is still raised. So, uh, no, no, no. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, on the same line to uh, Sivrani, so I am. I was wondering the how many instruments are mounted together simultaneously at the telescope. These instruments will be all mounted together. All mounted together. Okay, okay. Oh, these instruments. Uh, I mean, uh, you see here the man. These instruments are huge. 
Uh-huh, yes. In principle, they could be taken off the platform and mounted, but I don't think that the people at ESO will be very helpful with that. Yeah, they don't so know. this is the fact that we have this limitation in mass and volumes is because of all instrument must be mounted at the same time. So the instrument that I showed at the beginning, uh, this, uh, let me get uh, uh, these ones, let me, okay. So let me share again. Uh, all these instruments are supposed to be mounted at the same time in the two NASMI platforms. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you said initially, I think 125 uh, nights are available for this. Yes. So how do you prior? I mean, uh, I mean, how much time you give for each priority, or you complete the first? Okay. Okay. These are still to be decided, but okay. basically, what we plan to do is the following: uh, each partner will have a contribution. Mm -hmm. which can be translated in the fraction of the GPO nights. Okay, I see. This does not mean that he will get those nights and use as he wants, but he, he will have the opportunity to say how these GTO nights are used. Mm -hmm. And basically, not just on a specific project, because this is done by the science team, but we we'll say, I have 10 nights. Uh, I want five nights used for working group one of science team, which is exoplanets and circumstellar disk. Then I want two nights for the exagalactic group. So each partner will distribute the nights among the different working groups. And then at the end, each working group will know how much time will have for, its, uh, for the science programs. Okay, I see. And uh, uh, so there was a... Uh... You showed one slide with simulation. Uh, I think IGM simulation was there. I don't remember. Uh, yeah. The let me get there quickly. Okay. Let's. Population three. Let's start. Find... Yeah. 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 Okay. I have it just. Uh, uh, okay. So this uh, population three star and PISN, these are. This amplitude uh, is uh, mostly the model dependent, or you? How did you es estimate this? Thing? This is the no. This is based on the different abundance patterns due to okay. these uh, to these stars. Of course, uh, since we these are just uh, models, uh -huh. because uh, we this, as you know, pop three star has not been detected yet. So mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, what we expect to see. Okay. This is just to show that if these pop three stars mm -hmm. have these chemical enrichments as predicted by the models, we are able to see them. Of course, we will be able to see even different abundance patterns. Mm -hmm. But then maybe the interpretation will be more complex. To uh, I don't know whether it will be possible to attribute to pop three stars or not. But. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm sure that, I mean, you have to take into account that uh, all these science cases uh, mostly are studied just to outline uh, what we could do. But I expect that in 10 years from now, we will know much more about uh, yeah. each of the science cases. And maybe we will have decided some of these science cases are not interesting anymore, but there are new science cases which have new. emerged at Probably lost. Yeah, I can make sense. Yeah, Alexandro, uh, your mouth, um, sorry, your mic is muted. Echo, yeah, I am. I have lost you, sorry. Uh, so what I was saying uh, is that uh, um, I was making this example of the fact that maybe in 10 years from now, we will have different science cases, which are interesting. Mm -hmm. And the example is very simple. It's that of the multi-messenger astrophysics, the counterparts of the gravitational wave sources. 
In 2016, 2018, it was not considered. Mm -hmm. But yeah. of course, uh, we, with the high spectral resolution, we can, uh, we can do something. And indeed, the science team uh, in phase B will revise all the science cases. And then we are creating a, a, a subgroup of the science team, uh, a, a, which, it's mostly across the different working groups uh, to, 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 to address this issue of the multi-messenger astrophysics. And then uh, in the future, or whatever new science case uh, will, will come out. Okay. Uh, uh, and, then, so and then, of course, maybe the most interesting thing will be those with which we don't expect to see, as usual. Sivrani, <laughs> uh, do you have any question? Yeah, I just wanted to check, uh, like in at 350 nanometers, uh, um, added to the mirror reflectivity, what is the performance of GLAO? Uh, and how would it compare? No, we don't uh, go, uh, that I don't know, ground layer, I, I don't know. It depends on the number of actuators that, that will be there. But uh, the point is that uh, um, we are not very sensitive to the performance uh, of the actuators and how good is the correction because uh, we can work uh, with the uh, big fibers to collect the light, even if the PSF is not, uh, is not very, very good. Just uh, this is example. We can use the big fibers. We collect the light, and then we bring it to the to the spectrographs. Okay. This is one of the advantages of the fiber feeding. Mm -hmm. So yeah. even if uh, even if uh, some most uh, some science cases of this do not rely on the spec on the spatial resolution on the refraction limit, so they are science cases which can work, uh, which can provide very good results, even if the telescope is not performing very well in terms of image quality. Just because we just, you can use it, uh, the fibers as light bucket. We just collect uh, light from, uh, from the telescope and, and then do the spectrum. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. thanks. So uh, if there are no further questions, then, uh, let's thank uh, Alexandro for this nice talk, and uh, it was. Thank nice. you for having me. Yeah, it was nice hearing from you, and uh, also we hope that at some point of time you could visit us here, and uh, we could have very, you. very happily. I've never been to India, so I will come very happily. Yeah, so that would be a good chance. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with this, and thanks all the on online participants. And with this, we'll close for today and we'll meet again maybe next week. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao.